Welcome to our weekly show for the National Association of Independent Medical Practices. You can find us at naimp.org. NAIMP is an organization focused on helping independent medical practices become more successful by providing innovative discussions, networking with like-minded professionals, and opportunities for growth, education, and increased revenue. Check out our website today at naimp.org. Hello, and welcome to today's podcast. This is Shirley Cress Dudley, your host, and it's a pleasure today to have Dr. Oscar Sigurado. Dr. Sigurado is a physician, scientist, and biotechnology executive. He is the director of Medic Affairs Consulting, LLC. This firm, based in the Bay Area, helps healthcare stakeholders optimize the strategy and execution of clinical R&D, reimbursement, and market adoption. Over the past 30 years, he has worked in academia and the healthcare industry focusing on therapeutics and diagnostics in oncology, inflammation, and other therapeutic areas. He has been an executive medical director at Abbott Laboratories, AB and Becton Dickinson, most recently, the Chief Medical Officer at Crescendo Bioscience, an immunodiagnostics company. And today's title is Why Today's Reimbursement is Shaping Healthcare's Future. So it's a pleasure. I would like to welcome uh, Dr. Sigurado. Thank you, Shirley. I'd like to thank the NAIMP for this opportunity to discuss with you the healthcare care topic I am most passionate about. I'm a biomedical scientist and industry executive. Why am I interested in reimbursement of healthcare services for practicing physicians? The reason is that I am a physician. I have practiced. I care about medicine, about our patients, and especially about the patient-physician relationship. And throughout my academic and industry career, I learned valuable lessons about health economics, outcomes research, and reimbursement that are very relevant for practicing physicians. We will review today the key drivers that affect healthcare in general and your medical practice in particular. You have to understand them to take action. I'm sure that you are overwhelmed with all the news and buzzwords about cost containment initiatives. I will help you take an optimistic view at how physicians can create value and provide better care for patients, while at the same time managing costs and increasing profits, your costs and your profits. I will present to you some practical recommendations that will keep you glued to the, your screens. I'm going to use my anecdotal personal experience to illustrate the sea change in healthcare. My mother, had recently experienced transient episodes of atrial fibrillation or irregular heartbeats and has recovered from a minor stroke. Her doctor prescribed Pradaxa, an anticoagulant with better tolerability and convenience than generic warfarin. I helped my mother by interacting with these five key stakeholders. A government-run hospital, her doctor, who discuss with me the best course of action, the payer, with me preparing with her doctor and presenting a person in person a pre-authorization document justifying the $3,000 cost of Pradaxa versus the $200 cost per year of generic warfarin. The industry, researching studies and data on the risk-benefit profile of Pradaxa. And finally, most important of all, I was worried about the prognosis of my mother, the patient. We are in the middle of a perfect cost containment storm with the explosion of healthcare costs. The Affordable Care Act, accountable care organizations, and other changes impacting all stakeholders. This slide summarizes the key drivers for these five stakeholders. 
governments around the world are focusing on value-based care, replacing the fee-for-service model that has been dominating reimbursement for decades. Physicians are losing independence. They keep focusing on the care of patients, but they struggle to maintain their practices financially viable. Public and private payers are focused on cost containment. They have limited budgets and need to offset costs to cover more lives and better utilization of resources. The biomedical industry is rapidly changing its business model. Blockbusters with steady revenues allowing outsized R&D and marketing budgets are becoming an exception. The biomedical industry is rapidly changing, as I mentioned, and they must interact with the administration, physicians, and payers, also with patient advocacy groups. The patient is the most important stakeholder. We know that the ultimate objective of healthcare is to care for the health of the individual patient. However, the future of universal and truly affordable care for the patient is uncertain. Both public and private payers are in transition from a fee-for-service model to value-based reimbursement. Cost containment is the wrong approach when it just consists on passing costs among stakeholders, especially when it affects the weakest ones, patients getting higher copayments, deductibles, and premiums. On the other hand, value-based care is about the quality of health services, ultimately determined by clinical outcomes. In this graph, in the horizontal axis, you see the time in years, maybe decades, in the vertical axis, the revenue mix of fee-for-service versus value-based care or reimbursement. Note how the lines are crossing and changing positions in the graph. We are in this transition space in the middle of the graph. We don't really know where we are in terms of years or decades. How long will it take to really see a sh shift in, in reimbursement? The starting value-based value, value -based, uh, initiatives are accelerating. Payers are controlling costs via incentives and penalties. They are implementing electronic medical records, assessing the length of hospital stays, readmissions, and they are restricting prescriptions. They are limiting claims, indications, and are selecting doctors able to prescribe some medications. The starting principle of value-based care is focusing on value and quality, especially health outcomes. You may think that outcomes can only be measured in the context of well-designed studies. Think twice. Measuring outcomes for a practicing physician is also possible. It's not about seeing patients in five instead of ten minutes. You can have a simple way to record and track in your chart changes in patients' functionality, medication, number of office visits, or test results. We are overwhelmed by the enormous number of initiatives associated with the ongoing healthcare reform, especially those related to quality and accountability. I'm sure that many of the acronyms in this slide are new to you. Others may create anxiety for the lack of details and timing of implementation. Among many other activities, you need to maintain your certification, get CMA, CME credits, know key ICD-10 codes, and comply with HIPAA. You also need to learn or implement EMR, EHR technologies. Should you join an accountable care organization, a supergroup, or of like-minded uh, physicians. Additional uncertainty comes from the details from institutional guidelines focused on the quality of care, such as PQRS, Physician Quality Reporting System, PCORI, Patient-Centered Outcomes Research Institute, QIOS, Quality Improvement Organizations, or NQS, National Quality Strategy. Get ready 
to hear more and more about these initiatives. The most important role of the physician is to care for patients. Medicine is definitely science and evidence-based. However, most importantly, practicing medicine is about a personalized approach to the patient, considering medical information in the context of the person. A doctor needs flexibility in her, his practice, needs to leverage strengths and weaknesses and adapt her, his style and personality. Unfortunately, we may be moving into a cookie cutter mindset, an assembly line mentality, where the doctors must dedicate most of their efforts to follow mandates and guidelines. The amount of time that a physician is spending in non-care related activities is increasing. This is leading many physicians to give up their practices, joining hospitals, accountable health organizations, or integrated health systems. Let's be realistic, this is a logical trend. Medicine is becoming very complex and sophisticated in terms of patient care and administration. Therefore, systematic teamwork combined with personalized care is the only way forward. My view is that the patient-physician relationships need to be present, preserved. People need people, the human touch. It's about preserving this essential personal interaction. I recommend that you put personal interaction at the top of your priorities. Be there, be present with your patient, be compassionate and caring. In your daily to-do list, the individualized care for your patient should always be top of mind. Public and private payers are now focusing on measuring and controlling so-called resource utilization. How all available resources, including physician care, are utilized in real-world settings. The term cost-effectiveness is being translated into offsetting healthcare costs, reaching savings. Over the past several years, I've been interacting directly with the Blues, UHC, Edna, Humana, <clears throat> and payer provider organizations such as Kaiser Permanente in California. This is how I realized that payers are driven by greed and fear. Greed because they want to make sure that any new cost, deployment of resources, depicted here as a new medication being added to this shelf, requires savings, tangible savings somewhere else dropping off the shelf. Fear, because payers want to avoid confrontation with institutional and medical organizations or be the target of a negative press campaign. This is a shocking article I read recently in the Wall Street Journal. I found unbelievable that the pricing power of insurers is not under stronger scrutiny. When inflation and salary increases are in low single digits, even zero, how is it possible that insurance, insurers can initiate the bargaining round for 2016 with proposed increases up to 50% in certain plans? This is unacceptable. All other stakeholders would have to pick up the bill. At the end, patients and physicians will suffer the most. On the other hand, the biomedical industry <clears throat> is already under much more scrutiny and is required to be more transparent. This applies to research and development, with clinical trials being disclosed online, with raw study data provided to regulators or editors of peer-reviewed journals. The government, payers, and even investors are requiring, finance, are requiring financial disclosures to understand the pricing of the products. This covers 
story of the June 8th issue of Business Week analyzes in depth the pricing of breakthrough drugs to treat hepatitis C. More than 3 million Americans have hepatitis C. When Gilead introduced Harvoni, a follow-on drug for Sovaldi, both able to eliminate hepatitis C in just three months, the price tag was close to $100,000 for a 12-week treatment. Gilead is suffering a backlash, even with Congress stepping in. They are now negotiating with payers. I don't think anyone knows if the price is right, justified by offsetting costs of long-term care and R&D expenses. The key notion here is that expensive drugs, especially in the oncology space, are becoming the norm. And the entire healthcare system must find a way to guarantee best care at affordable prices. <clears throat> the pharma industry is now moving into specialty drugs. These are used by specialists and do not require large marketing and commercialization budgets. The costs are shifting from primary to specialty care. I would suggest that if you are a primary care physician, you try to capture revenue from specialists. One suggestion I have for practice, practicing doctors is to identify patients that meet the guidelines for certain therapies and potentially profit from personalized diagnostics and interventions before referring those patients to the specialist. Let me conclude this webcast with a critical question. Is our healthcare system patient-centric? Truly patient-centric? I think that only a strong physician-patient relationship will ensure a truly personalized medicine. I think that the patient is often subject to separate medical interactions, often without someone consolidating procedures and interventions to help the patient make informed decisions. This situation is even more dramatic if we consider how in a stronger job market, more workers move from one insurance plan to the next. This explains why insurers are not truly interested in the long-term benefits of eradic eradicating hepatitis C, the example we discussed before. I think that we as a society need to make tough choices. Cost containment should definitely be driven by value-oriented clinical outcomes. However, compassion and a personalized care of patients should also be at the top of public policy. I thank you very much for the opportunity to discuss these ideas with you. Please contact me directly if you have any questions or suggestions about the five drivers affecting the future of healthcare. These are a few notes about the focus and expertise of my Medic Affairs consulting firm. Please feel free to contact me with any inquiries. Thank you so much for your attention. Thank you very much, Dr. Cigarado. Um, and to reach you, um, it's your name, oscar.segurado at medicaffairs.com. Um, and if you'd like to see some of the slides that he referenced, go to naimp.org. We appreciate those of you that listen on iTunes, but would love for you to come to naimp.org to see the slides. So uh, thank you again for really, really good information. Um, we appreciate your time and your expertise today. Thank you.